Hey everybody, welcome to Unscripted, where we're all about inspiring better conversations and thinking more deeply and critically about faith, life, and leadership. I am Jack today and excited because I have my good friend and <laughs> second time appearing. Second time. Uh, friend here, Ben Kornick. Thank you so much for being here, man. Man, I'm so glad to be here. Awesome. And honestly, it's a huge honor to be invited back a second time. Yeah, like, I, I, it should yeah. be. Just kidding. <laughs> like, my, but seriously, my excitement's been building for days. Like, I keep thinking, I'm like, yeah, I get to be back on Unscripted, so. Oh. Oh, this awesome. is a lot of fun for me. I'm so glad you made it out. Uh, yeah. So when we're talking about uh, what we're going to talk about, we like threw around a couple of different ideas and mm-hmm. like, it's been like a, what do we want to talk about? I, I knew I wanted you back on here, but yeah. but the actual topic that I, we kind of landed on that we wanted to toss around for a little while was really just the sermon, which maybe sounds corny and like boring to some people, but for us, that's like everything. Yeah. Cause it's like what we do. I know. Like yeah, we spend so. <laughs> a lot of time every week thinking about this one thing. And actually, yeah. uh, if you remember, I talked about this last time, but we have spent an entire year together mm-hmm. talking about thinking about being, being taught how to compose and yeah. create and deliver an excellent sermon. Mm-hmm. So that'd be fun to just like chat about it. And, and first, like, like when you think about the sermon and well, let's, let's talk about this first every week when you're talking about a sermon, you're, you're you speak like 20 ish sometimes a year. Yeah. Like a, about tw- I'd say 24, 26 times a year, something like that. All right. At so, my church. Yeah. So like half the Sundays. Yes. You're given a sermon, which is a yeah. lot. It's a lot. Yeah. It adds up. Yeah. How much time do you put into the sermon? Because I think this is fun for me to ask you because the listeners, like if I said that, be like, oh my gosh, that's that's crazy. But I'm curious yes. what you think. Well, uh, so because I'm a teaching pastor at my church, yeah. um, I think that part part of my job is even helping other preachers on staff like with their sermons. And so sometimes that it's just as easy for me as like finding like a really great quote or an article. And I send it to one of them. And sometimes it feels a little bit like, oh, man, like I could probably use that for one of mine. But I know that with whatever they're talking about, it's going to work better for theirs. So um, but then as far as so like that's part of my time. But then the other part of my time is just prepping for the messages that I'm going to be preaching. And I can put anywhere from 20 to 40 hours into a message. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, I wish like my top is at your bottom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's amazing. That's so great. Uh, yeah. So you get to spend like 20 to 40 hours on a sermon. Well, like, why would you spend that much time on a sermon? Because that's like the skeptic, right? Like, why mm-hmm. would you need to spend that much time? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. And, and maybe think it through like research, writing, and then working on delivery. Like, how, how yeah. does that all get built up? Well, um, usually I'm just uh, I'm just listening to other guys' sermons and just memorizing them. And yeah. uh, no, I'm That's just funny. kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's uh, I mean I do I do I will listen to other people's sermons, but that usually comes later in the process for me. Um, so to me, why it's so important is it's funny because we're talking about a sermon. Yeah. And to us, like talking about how we talk about God, that's a really big deal because we're preachers. That's like what we do. But for a lot of people who might be listening, um, a lot of them probably hear a lot of sermons on a pretty regular basis. Sure. And so a lot of us, like, we we sign up to listen to sermons, uh, whether it's online or whether it's in person. Like, th- So this is a big part of a lot of people's lives. Sure. And um, so to me, like, the reason that it matters to spend that much time on it is twofold. One is because like people are actually like spending that time listening. And in our culture, there's a lot of other things that people will spend a ton of time preparing because they know people are going to participate in it. So to me, I'm like, well, that's a huge factor. But even more important than that is if one person showed up to, to listen to the message, I still would preach it um, just as faithfully as I was going to, because to me, it's also an act of worship. Like sure. it's, it's a way that I am pouring out like my gifting that God has given me, uh, to be able to honor him. And, uh, and you know, there's, there's multiple preachers who talk about this, like guys who, you know, have been around a lot longer than us, but they'd say that, Hey, when you, when you preach, this is actually part of your spiritual act of worship, you know, like how, how Romans 12 talks about. Yeah, yeah. And so to me, like when, when that shifted in my brain as like, this isn't just part of my job, but this is also like how I worship God. Then like the, the weeks where, and like, the, I, I have to like say like, sometimes I do spend less than 20 hours on a message. Like there are those weeks where I'm just like, oh man, I got to throw this together. But there's something in me that then feels like, man, is there a way that I could have honored God better with that process? 
And like, so how do I prioritize then to be able to make sure that that, if that's like one of the main ways God has gifted me and called me to serve, then how do I prioritize that as an act of worship? Yeah. So I love that you're talking about it as worship because I feel that when I'm hmm. preparing for it, there's this connection that happens for me yeah. where I feel closer to God when I'm really spending time thinking about how to communicate it. It actually clarifies things for myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know who it was or somebody I'm not, I'm not going to say a name cause I'm probably gonna get it wrong. Somebody you talked about like the most powerful way for somebody to understand God's truths is to communicate it to kids. Yeah. Because you yeah. have to get it down to this level of it's pure, mm-hmm. it's simple, it's straightforward and a kid can understand it. Yeah. And I love how Christianity and faith in Jesus following him can be as complex as people that write theses on these thousands of pages of books, whatever. Yep. And then at the same time, succinct enough to go into uh, a, a teaching for a kid, a mm-hmm. child. It's amazing. So I love how that's worshipful. Yeah. Like you, you get inside of what's, yeah. what's happening there and it's, it's delightful. It's, it's fun. It's joyful. Totally. It's also hard. Yes. So, <laughs> so here's my question from that. And I want to go back to the, why you spend so much time on it. I do spend a lot of, like I, about 20 hours is what I budget for it. Yep. Um, that's what I, I like to on an ideal week. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's 15. Mm-hmm. I'd like it to be 20. Um, I, I want to get back to that in a second, but first you talk about it as worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it ever, and I say this tongue in cheek, uh, is it ever something that is convicting? <laughs> I feel like every time, right? Like, that's the crazy part. So, uh, you, you know, er, earlier before we started recording, you and I were talking about parenting. Yeah. And we were saying how like parenting is like this process of like, f- you feel like you're like raising these tiny humans and trying to teach them how to live. And then as you go along, you just keep finding out where you have to change as a person. Absolutely. Like to be a more effective parent who's actually helping your children. And I found a very similar process in being a pastor and being a preacher is that, you know, there was a time in my life where I felt like I had to have it all together and I had to have all the answers if I was going to be a good preacher. And now I'm like, oh, it's just about like faithfully continuing to follow Jesus and using a gift that he's given me. So every time I'm preparing for a message, like there'll be times where people come up to me after a message and be like, man, that was really helpful. I was like, for me too. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Same. this weird, weird moment where they're like looking at me like, who says that? And I'm going, no, like you have to understand, like as God was like helping me see that in his word, man, it was, it was doing something in my heart. That's why I wanted to share it in the message is like, how could I not share this incredible truth? Yeah. And so it is super convicting for me. And, um, and I think like, of course, like that also helps keep us on our toes for sure. And sometimes I wonder if I would like, like to me, sometimes things feel like a divine setup. Like God, I was going to mention this. Okay. Go, well, going it, well I was just going to say that I feel like, so like, would I, would I pursue God as much as I do if I wasn't a preacher or did he put me into the role of a preacher? Not because he needed me to be a preacher. Like, oh yeah, but like, not like he needed like, okay, we need this, like the world needs this guy to preach. It's more like, did he put me in it? Cause I needed it. Yeah. And like, because he's like, I, this is how I'm going to help you grow into the person that I've called you to be. There is something about doing the process that happens that way or you need it. Mm-hmm. And I thought you were going in a different direction. <laughs> well, thought, I'd love to hear your perspective so the then. The direction I thought you were going in is for me, nine out of 10 sermons that week, it just hits oh. me so bad, right? Yep. Like this week was no different. Literally talking about, uh, we talked about going Jesus in the wilderness, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, and this is going to air a few weeks from, or a couple weeks from now. Yeah. Uh, but in the wilderness, uh, there, there's a wilderness period where Jesus is in there for 40 days. And it's also, it's, it's symbolic in a lot of ways, but it's mm-hmm. also preparation. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we have to go through wildernesses. So we are prepared for when we experience more difficulties in life. Like we went through that so we can know we can trust God, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it was one of those moments. It was one of those weeks where like I had some instances in, in life where we just had to trust God. So I'm mm-hmm. preparing for this and it's like, ah, yeah. Gosh, why did this happen now? Mm-hmm. And so you have to be convicted of how you should live in that moment. It's great, and it's also frustrating. Because <laughs> yes, because for me, and, and Meg knows this, there are often times where I'll, I'll say a comment, something like, "Well, I'm writing a sermon this week, and I'm realizing I probably should love you in a better way right now because I'm messing up." <laughs> yes, yeah, th- there have been times where, uh, and I hate to admit this, but I have. 
I've been more cognizant of like being a better husband or parent because I know what I'm about to preach on Sunday (laughs) and I don't want to be like a hypocrite, (laughs) which is probably hypocritical in and of itself. But I'm like, I want to practice what I preach. And so like in, in one way it can seem almost hypocritical, but in my mind, I'm like, but I'm going to hold myself to that same standard and like that same idea that I want to call other people to. Yeah. But it is like, man, it is so true. Like the weeks I'm going to preach on patience, like that's like when I hit every red light. Um, that's when like I get stuck behind two school buses, you know, in a row. And I'm just like, and there's that moment where I want to get really angry. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this, <laughs> this is, this is like real life. Uh, you know, like this is God bringing me through like patience 101. Yeah. It's like, and then, and then it's great. Cause then you get to use it as sermon illustration. It's so true. So, I'm going to do yeah. that right now. Actually, you said school buses. I have to admit something. Yeah. So I was coming down the street. There's a school bus and I get like parallel with it. Like I'm right beside it as it's putting the stop sign out. And I'm like, do I go? Do I not? I'm like, I'm just going to go because there's no kids. I'm right beside it. I think it's safe. It's fine. And then the crosswalk is like right ahead. And the lady that does the crosswalk, she's like, she shook her head at me. I'm like, no. I felt so much shame in that moment. Yeah. And I'm like, oh gosh, I can't do that. I'm a pastor, right? Like that's the thought Mm -hmm. that goes through your head. And it was fine. It was yeah. good. It was no big deal. No kids were hurt. In Everybody that. recognized you. They're like, isn't that the guy from Ripon Community <laughs> Church? Probably, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. There's that, that was a moment. But I realized, like, that's a powerful shame moment. Like, she didn't make me want to stop more. She just made me feel awful about myself. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. that's hilarious. And a total aside, you just reminded me with this yeah. bus. Yeah. So That's good ammo for the future, though. It like, is. That, It'll that has out. to show up in a sermon <laughs> in the future. It totally will. Uh, okay. So... There's the, there's the convicting that happens that have, and, and that's in there. There's also um, a powerful aspect to it where you're trying to give as much time and energy to it because it impacts many people, mm-hmm. whether it's two or 200 or 2000, whatever it is, you're giving this message. And, and for me, and I'm curious what you think about this. For me, I think about that. And think about how when people actually enact what's taught, Mm -hmm. how it changes, not just those people, but communities and families and schools and workplaces and all of those things. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Like when you talk about like putting time and effort into something, does that register when you're giving a sermon, when you're thinking about it? Like where are you in that way? Oh, totally, man. Like to me, I mean, the main purpose of a sermon is that people are connecting with God and what he wants for them. Yeah. But James said in, you know, his letter that faith without works is dead. So it's, it's, it's always going to lead to some like, Hey, this is how we can, this is how we can interact with the scripture. This is how we can interact with God himself and what he wants to do. And if you think about that, like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., the I have a dream speech is what most people call it, but it was a sermon. Yeah. The man was preaching a sermon. Yeah. And so to me, there's these moments where you have to realize like how powerful words are. And the fact that the very beginning of the Bible is uh, like God spoke and things came into existence. Now, I don't believe that I have the power to just like speak and like make something appear or things like that. Because like that, that can get down a really weird, Very uh, weird route of theology really fast. Yes. So, but in the sense that like when, so like, so like those are my words, but if I speak God's words, yeah. like if I like read the Bible and I speak that, the, the word says like his word doesn't return void. Like it, it accomplishes its purposes. So to me, that's like a super powerful thing. And it's just really weird thing to be like, I'm just a normal person, but I get up and I like represent God and I like speak his words and like that feels really heavy and really exciting all at the same time. And then to know that that can actually transform marriages and families and communities and workplaces in schools like that. It's like, it's so exciting, but at the same time, there's like a a weight that comes with that. That's probably really healthy. um, But yeah, it's like I feel all that at the same time. All of it at the same time. That's totally true. And we haven't even gotten to the, the substance yet. So I want to no. go there. So when we talk about the substance of what's taught, mm-hmm. how is, I guess, the question. So you just mentioned it. When you speak God's words and they don't come back empty, mm-hmm. 
what are we talking about and, and how does that work? Like as, we, as we've thought about that this past year and mm -hmm. I mean, we were with uh, one pastor out in New York City and Rich Lotus, he was talking about how character, right, matters yeah. so much. And you can't yeah. speak from uh, an empty character. Mm -hmm. Like that's not gonna, like a, I can't remember the, the quote that I wrote down from what he said, but mm -hmm. it was so helpful to think if you're not resting the way God wants you to rest, if you're not uh, practicing uh, the types of things that help you draw closer to God, you, you shouldn't be speaking. Mm -hmm. Now he was really bold about that. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> when it comes to the substance of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit more. Like we, we talked a little bit about like the gospel, right? Like that's it. Mm -hmm. What is that? Why does it matter? And why does it transform something? I'm giving like 13 questions, but I'm curious. Yeah. You, there's a lot of questions in there, but I think, <laughs> I think I know what you mean. And for me, there's this sense where, um, I mean, you, you look through history, um, and I'm a big history guy. So like, to me, like there's, there's this, there's this arc throughout history that when God's word is introduced into a society, like things happen, sure. things change. And so there's this sense where when people hear the word of God, um, I think that because, because we have a spirit because there's something in us that connects and knows like this is different than just like your regular everyday philosophy. This is different than just like the latest human ideas. This is different than a TED talk. There's something different about this. And like we can we can sense that. And uh, and that's not like that's not even esoteric. Like it's not what do like you mean by that esoteric that's meaning like it's not like this like big like weird thing that we can't like understand or it's like this like unknowable thing. Um, it just me like to me like the the word of God. The fact that people can interact with it on that level and like they can sense that this isn't just a normal message. Sure, uh, I think that just shows us exactly how we were created. Like we were created to connect with God. So when we hear His voice, when we hear His words. There's something in us that connects with that immediately. And even, even if people choose not to follow him and choose not to do his will, there's something in us that knows that like it has to be reckoned with. Oh, I like that. Because even those who would say that it's not true feel like they have to address it. They have to address it. Because it's the most powerful force of philosophy or theology on the planet. So they have to reckon with it. That's really good. Yeah. I also think it's true. Mm. So I know that sounds silly and obvious to us, but yeah. but when you start talking about the gospel, mm -hmm. which we would say is the ability to have forgiveness and redemption because Jesus conquered sin and death through the cross and the empty grave, mm -hmm. uh, empty tomb, whatever, um, there is something so, it resonates so deeply inside of you because it feels right. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds way too, like, uh, touchy feely, but, but it's just like, when you talk about how the things in our lives change, you can go two possible directions. Mm -hmm. You can either go towards more violent, more angry, more shame filled, mm. more of those things, or you can go towards lighter, freer, more peaceful, more joyful. Those are two options, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and there has to be a force that pushes you one direction or another. Mm -hmm. And the only force I've found that inserts into humanity the amount of energy we need to go in the good direction is, is forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Is somebody saying, you're forgiven and I don't need anything back from you. Wow. Like, right? Like, there's, yeah. there's that, that thing where you're like, I, I can't do this on my own. I need someone to, to like, well, like push the domino over mm -hmm. in my life where I can go towards those things. And yeah. I don't know. Just think about how like, this is actually true and actually changes something when you realize how powerful it is in your life. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about it, y you can't ignore how meaningful and true it is. Oh, totally. Because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Yeah. And so for me, there was this, like, you talk about, like, getting things down on the level of a kid. Like, what, what caused me to want to know more about Jesus was reading the Chronicles of Narnia by oh, C.S. Lewis. Great. Yeah. And I didn't know that he wrote those about the Bible. So like to me, like I felt like I got tricked, like because I like figured it out, like at the end of the books, like I was like, oh, this is like about the Bible. And so I was like, oh, come on. And then I was like, well, these, these books have been out for like 50 years. I could have like found out. So um, so then I got intrigued and then I wanted to like start like understanding the Bible because I'm like, look, if Jesus is anything like Aslan, like he's got to be awesome. 
So like, I've got to figure this stuff out. And there was something in it that I knew was true. And, and the reason I bring that up is because I think even our narratives that we create, like our greatest stories throughout, uh, you know, like society and culture, like they all, they all center around these same themes. Yeah. And like, then like you read the Bible and you're like, oh, it's because this is the story of humanity. This has been our story since the beginning, since the fall, we have been trying to find redemption. Mm -hmm. We have been trying to find hope. We've been trying to find healing. We've been trying to find purpose and meaning. And then you read the Bible and it's this story of a God who loves us so much that he is like doing anything and everything in his power to allow us to find all of those things. Yeah. And so like when I found out like that's the story of the scriptures. So like before I ever even understood the theology of the scriptures or like what it all really meant, like when I understood that's like who Jesus was and that the Bible was all about that, I'm like, okay, now I want to understand this book. Yeah. Okay. How's that impacted your speaking, your teaching? Well, I, th I think that for me, I have to remember that when I'm preaching, there are some people who grew up in the church and some people who didn't, and they all still have to understand the thing that I just said. Yeah. yeah. Like even people who grew up in the church, sometimes like they're like the older brother and the prodigal son. Like they, like they still are missing. Um, so like they're, they're prodigal in that sense, because like they're missing the fact that they're right there in like all the presence of uh, like all that God offers. And yet they still haven't actually understood like what you were talking about, the idea of forgiveness and like the, the power of that. And, you know, like the, the whole idea of like, whatever, whatever grace we've been given, we should extend. extend yeah. And then there's the people who think because of the life they've lived, because of like going out and living wildly and, you know, they've been living in the pigsty. They're like, well, there's no, I'm not religious enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not cleaned up enough. And so there's no way that like I somehow can be a part of this. And it's like, and yet both of them, like God loves both of them. The father wanted to see both of them change. Mm -hmm. Like the father had uh, grace and compassion on both of them but they each had their own issues. And so to me, when I'm, when I'm speaking, I want to like, I don't want to, I don't just want people to understand an idea. Yeah. Like a lot of people do that. Like mm. you don't have to be a Christian and you don't have to be a preacher to get people to understand an idea. Ted talks are amazing. Exactly. And I love them, but I have a very specific idea that is transformative and it's more than an idea. It's a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so like, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more than anything. I just want people to understand how much God loves them, how much he wants them to be with him. And like, if they can understand that the transformation that comes isn't God, let me change myself so that I can be more worthy of you. It's God, let me be in relationship with you and then you'll change me. Yeah. I'm and like, that's that. the good yeah. news. That's, that's really good, man. I feel like we're giving like 15 mini sermons right now. Yeah. This is fun. Well, we might as well, right? <laughs> we're talking yeah. about the sermon. Yeah. We might as well. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Uh, okay. Now it's really interesting. You said that you have the background of r growing up in a home that wasn't Christian, mm -hmm. like didn't talk about it at all, mm -hmm. or maybe opposed to it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, actually. <laughs> uh, and then on the other end of it, there's, there's you, the last, how many years would it be? for you since you've been a Christian. Yeah, I was just thinking about this recently. Um, so 2004 is when I became a Christ follower. So okay, what is so that? 18 like? years? 18 years. Oh. You blow in your mind, you're finally an adult. Yeah, Good man, for you. that's crazy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual adult now. Great. Yeah, now so <laughs> I finally made it. <laughs> that's so yeah. fun. But what's interesting is you probably have both mindsets because you've been so steeped in it for the past 18 yeah. years. Yeah. And on the opposite end, you have the time that you weren't. For, for me, I grew up in the church and it's kind of always been there. And I've had mm -hmm. to push really hard to, to really think about things from an alternative perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have both and that's really interesting, but you probably can tend towards one or the other. Uh, how, how have you kind of wrestled with that when you're giving a sermon? Like, is there some things you try to avoid or some like really practical? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, like, okay, well, so to be as practical as possible, I really try to avoid like Christianese. Yeah. And I, I know that that's a very Christianese word to even use. But <laughs> um, but to me, like anything that's like too churchy yeah. that people can't easily access the idea. Um, I And part of that is almost utilitarian. Like I'm like, I don't want to spend the time in my message trying to explain a term that people don't really need to know. Yeah. Um, so I will often, I will just make sure that I'm not using like, words that are too churchy. 
Um, and like a, an example would be like sanctification. Correct. Um, it's a super important idea, but you could also just say like, God wants to transform you uh, to be more like him. And that's and more, sanctification. Yeah. More people would be like, oh, I get that. Yep. And so unless I'm actually teaching on sanctification and people need to know that word because like that's the point of the message, yeah. then I'll do that. But if it's just a sub point in my message, I'm not going to use that word. So to me, that's like a very easy way that I can clean that up so that non-believers uh, or people who haven't grown up in a church, like they don't have to sit there and like pretend like they know what I just said. <laughs> totally. Because everyone else apparently knows. But then there's a lot of people who grew up in the church who are like, look, man, I've been hearing that word for, you know, 37 years and I still have no idea what it means. And that's more true than you might realize. Exactly. <laughs> it's real. So I, so even for that crowd of people, like, it's like, you know what, like you, you can like drop the front. Like you, you don't have to have, be this Christian who has it all together. Like, let's just, let's come to God's word together. Like it's a feast. Like yeah. let's all sit at the table and just feast together. Yeah. And so like, that's one practical way I do that. Another way I think is just through story. Yep. Everybody connects with stories. And so I think that's a moment that like when I tell on myself, um, or I just tell a compelling story of like something that took place in someone else's life. I think that whether you grew up in the church or not, like, I mean, we're all watching the same shows on Netflix. We're all watching the, you know, like, so we we all love to go see the same. I don't watch that garbage. I don't, kidding. no, I don't. I only watch, I only watch pure flicks. And, um, <laughs> What's but that? I don't I don't, it's like a Christian Netflix. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's so great. anyway, um, but for me, like, uh, t- like, I'm like, okay, if we're all like enamored with a lot of the same stories, it shows me that down at our core, there's something that we all relate to. So there's like all the stuff up here that it's like, oh, well, I'm this. Like I grew up uh, Catholic or I grew up Lutheran. I grew up non-Christian or Baptist or whatever. And I'm like, but like, let's go a few layers deeper. And like, we all have so many of the same fears and insecurities and desires and hopes. Yeah. And so like, I think stories get to that level way faster than just, you know, trying to explain a point. Yeah, no, it's super true. I've- I love telling stories and yeah. like we, we were in one more place and the, the pastor I was talking about, it was all about telling Bible stories well. And it was yeah. amazing. Yes. But that has been something I've loved for forever. Like, mm-hmm. since, like I think I, I told the story of Esther. That was the whole sermon. I literally just stood up there and told the story of Esther. Yeah. That was it. Nothing else. Just tell the story years ago. Uh, but there's something about when you realize those stories that are in the Bible actually apply. I've never been really good at, at addresses like Bible addresses, like Luke seven fifteen or whatever. I would never know what those things are. Yeah. I'm just not good at that. Mm-hmm. But for me, I can like just throw out stories like that. Like it's mm-hmm. about that one, or like hey, like Zacchaeus. I can tell that one off the top of my head, or whatever. Yeah. These stories are so powerful and mm-hmm. meaningful. And I have a my my fancy degree from my college is rhetoric, and which is funny. Yeah. Uh, but it's all about. Uh, communication and more of a classical form of it. But one Mm -hmm. of the things that I learned there and like, I didn't realize how important this was when I was leaving, but Mm. we're actually, we don't reason with logic. Sounds awful. Sounds scary, but we actually reason with stories. Wow. We reason with narratives. If something rings true to us, like you hear a story like, Oh yeah, that, that makes sense. I can identify with that. I'm more likely to agree with you. Hmm. And that's powerful, which that is powerful. makes sense why the Bible would be written in story form. Yeah. And there's so many things that are in there that talk about. So when you're speaking, yeah. like giving a sermon, telling stories and telling those stories that's true. is powerful. Uh, it's, it's funny because uh, there's a guy who goes to my church who's, uh, he wants to be a lawyer. So like, that's like, sure. what, that's like his whole track right now. And so he's a student and he's, you know, and he did this like mock trial thing recently and his, his side lost. And I said, well, why did you lose? And he was talking about all the very like tactical and practical reasons for why he believes they lost. But he kept saying, but we had better evidence that like, he said it to me like multiple times, we had better evidence. And I kept asking him, then why did the other side win? And like, it, he just kept going to like, well, we had better evidence. I'm like, yeah, but you guys lost. So why did they win? And he said, I think they had a better presentation. He finally was like, oh, like, if you're asking me why they win, I'm like, yeah, I've only asked you like four times. He's like, (laughs) oh, it's because they had a better presentation. And I'm like, okay, so tell me about that. Like, why does that matter? And, And I'm like, what about their presentation was better? And he finally got to the place where he said they used a lot of stories and we used a lot of facts. Yeah. And I was just like, that's it right there. In a court of law. 
there are times where the jury and the judge are more moved by the stories and by by hearing people convey their own experience and their emotion than to have a lawyer rattle off the evidence and the factual uh, the, the factual parts of the trial. There, like there's something in us that's like I'm less concerned about that, and I'm more concerned about that woman who just told her story. Yeah, it's Isn't, so true. It's wild, but like I think there's truth to that. But yeah, and I think the interesting aspect to that is this: he may have had better evidence. The other person had evidence, mm-hmm. and they just figured out a way to tell the story with the evidence better. Like, Absolutely. Like there, you, there's a story in both of them, mm-hmm. and you just have to use. You have to figure out how to help people take in that evidence. Mm-hmm. I, I laugh because you're talking about Netflix. Well, sometimes we'll watch stuff with my kids for Netflix and they have like random like history, silly things that are really great and well done. Yeah. And they tell the stories of these like Marie Antoinette or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they'll tell these stories, these people, but it's a story. It's not just a textbook listing these things. And I'm thinking these kids are so lucky. Yeah. Like when I was going to school, <laughs> I just got the textbook, read the story and mm-hmm. forgot it five minutes later. Yeah. Totally. These, these kids are like learning the stories and visual storytelling. That's beautiful and really mm-hmm. well. And now they've got it like seared into their brains. Yeah. That's amazing. Totally. But, and so yeah. when we give a sermon, like this is what we're doing. Mm-hmm. We're trying to make it and present it in ways where people can hear it and take it in and then they leave with it. Because the evidence still matters. Exactly. Like, it's still truth. Like, we're saying it's factual, but the, what, what you just said I love is that we want we want them to hear it in a story that, like, sticks with them. Yeah. And Jesus modeled this, right? Like, he He's told stories all the time. Like, we call them parables, but they're stories. Exactly. He did it all the time. Yeah. So if he did it, you know, I, should probably do it too. I'm pretty sure he's the greatest preacher who ever walked the face of the earth. So, yeah, it's probably pretty good to learn from him. Let's, let's model after him. That's yeah. a good idea. Okay. I feel like I don't even know what we're at for time, but I feel like we're getting <laughs> long. So I want to finish up with one more question. Mm-hmm. And, and that question is this, uh, what's your hope? So you stand up there, mm. you prepared 20 to 40 or 15 hours that week, whatever it is. And you get to the end and you walk up on stage and you got how many, however many people out there listening, what's your hope? Hmm. That's a great question. It's definitely not to have somebody go, hey, great sermon. <laughs> like, that's cool. I yeah. love, but to me, my hope is that someone knows God better and it's going to change the way they live their life, like that they're going to live with more freedom hmm. and they're going to live with uh, more purpose and more identity and they're going to understand like who God created them to be. And like, they're going to understand who they are and they're going to understand whose they are. Yeah. And so to me, that's my hope because that actually will change them. And that's like, that's what God wants. Like he wants more of our hearts. And so in my own sermon writing process, like, like how, how much am I letting that truth impact me? Yeah. Um, like he wants more of my heart. And so like, there's that part of it, but like, it's when I hear stories of people saying, you know, like I'll, just one of the things that comes to my mind is uh, recently I preached a sermon and just as a sub point in the message, I talked about how we can, we can trust like whatever it was I was talking about. I just remember saying we can trust this because God is our father. Hmm. And then I, so then I was like, if I'm going to say that I have to speak to the fact that like myself and many other people didn't grow up with uh, a good, healthy understanding of what a father is. Yeah. So then I just talked about how God is this father who really loves us. And like, even when our own earthly fathers have let us down, God doesn't. And, you know, and I I mean, I really went into that for like a few minutes because I, I just had this sense that there's, I don't know. I just was like, I feel like I have to explain it this way. And maybe it was just for this one young woman. Maybe it was for multiple people, but she's the one who walked up afterwards. And she was like, that like changed the whole way I see God. (sighs) And she's like, I've always like, I had a really unhealthy relationship with my father. Um, I always felt a lot of shame and a lot of brokenness around that. And she's like, when you talked about God being our father, she's like, right away, I kind of put up a wall being like, well, if he's like going to be like a dad to us, I don't like that. And then she was like, she talked about how that really changed her and set her free and how she's like, I've never understood this before. And now I really understand God's love for me. Yeah. And I was like, that's it. 
Yeah. Like to me, that's the moments that I preach for yeah. is when people understand who God really is. Cause when we really behold God for who he actually is, it will always change us. Yeah, man. That is really, really good. I think that's a good note to end on actually. <laughs> and I think, I mean, just saying we, we give sermons weekly or however many times a, a year. And mm-hmm. when I think about that process, the hope is always just to to see people be transformed, to see people know God, know Jesus, have a relationship with him. Um, for us, it's to represent Jesus well, like actually go and do it. Yeah. That's a big thing for us. And uh, man, to know you have a father in heaven that loves you, even if you didn't know what that was like at one point in your life, but to know it now uh, is incredibly powerful and really, yeah. really amazing. So with that, thanks for talking about sermons. Thanks Absolutely, for being man. on Unscripted for a second time. It yeah. was an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you so much. Yeah. And thanks, Pre- man. I appreciate you too, man. Awesome. Well, yeah. thanks for, for listening in, everybody. And we will see you again in a couple weeks.